that's a good time to get started. I'm really, really delighted to welcome um, Professor Phil Trotter to our session today. Um, so today here we are in the Nexus seminar. The Nexus seminar is a um, session that is a, a series that is hosted jointly by Serena Couchy, my colleague from United Nations University Flores Institute, and here at TA Dresden, um, the Kalowitz Junior Professorship. So I am hosting it. And um, we are delighted to have Philip joining us today. I'll give you a bit of background on, on Philip. So I've known Philip, I think, uh, for more than five years, <laughs> or soon to be five years around that time. Um, and uh, Philip is currently a, a um, professor at Wuppertal University that I just tried to think of. There's an English expression for that, as well as a um, fellow at the University of Oxford. And prior to that, he was at RWTH Aachen and then uh, worked as a consultant in between. And so um, I'm delighted, Philip, that you're taking the time to join us today. Um, just a few things uh, for the participants with regard to housekeeping. So you'll have a Q&A window that you can um, enter any content related questions in. And then there's also the regular chat where you can ask any technical question if you have any issues understanding anything. So here we have um, the wonderful Zainab in the background who will organize and manage all of that. And with that, I am um, a warm welcome to Philip and I'll uh, hand over to you. Thank you so much, Samanti, um, and welcome everybody for join, um, to, to the seminar. Thanks a lot for joining, and yeah, thanks a lot for having me. It's, it's, a, it's a huge honor and pleasure. I uh, uh, took the liberty of going through the list of speakers that you've had as part of this Nexus seminar. I understand it's the 69th already, uh, which is quite an achievement in itself, and uh, it's a very long list of very acclaimed uh, people, so I'm uh, extremely humbled that, that I was asked to uh, to also contribute uh, to this very well-organized, uh, uh, serious, and very timely uh, content that you have on there. So thanks a lot, Samanti. It's, it's an absolute pleasure, and thanks also to um, United Nations University Flores to, you know, for, for having me. Um, all right. Uh, the way how I want to do this, uh, I have a presentation scheduled. Uh, of course, uh, I, you know, I have some slides. Um, what I usually like to do, I know that it is protocol usually to have the questions at the at the end, which I'm super happy to do as well. Um, I do understand with the Q and A. Let's let's see, but I do have it open here on the screen. I might miss it here and there a question, but I actually do. Uh, I have a preference for, you know, people just throwing in random questions as they appear, and then uh, we can get into a bit of uh, more discussion. So don't hold back with any questions or comments or concerns or anything, and I'll try to kind of answer them uh, on the on the go and on the fly as well as at the end. So let's see, uh, hopefully that works. So let me share my screen here. Right. Is this visible to everybody? Samanti, you can you can nod your head. Okay, that's great. Um, fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. So today, let me just set up the yeah. So the chat. I have the chat open now and the Q and A now as well. So let's see if that if that works. Um, fantastic. So today, I'll I'll talk about African entrepreneurs and uh, um, and my experience with with studying African entrepreneurs, which I have been doing for the better part of the last decade, and. Um, uh, what I have found in this context is that uh, there really uh, is, is an incredible amount of innovation uh, on the tech side, but especially on the business model uh, side as well, as well, where uh, some of these innovators are moving very quickly into um, yeah, very deep and broad understandings of sustainable development and value propositions for sustainable development. And I think there's a lot that, uh, you know, people all around the globe and uh, especially in the global north can learn uh, from these innovations and from these approaches. And so that's what this talk is going to be about. Um, definitely at the beginning, very critical to shout out uh, some of these uh, entrepreneurs that have helped me to understand what they're doing. It's, it's really like, uh, you know, uh, they, they're geniuses and they're, they're uh, brilliant in, in the, the solutions that they came up with and enabled me to, to study them and, and uh, look at them. And many of them are in the Ugandan off-grid energy sector or in the East African uh, off-grid energy sector. And we'll look at a couple of them throughout the, the talk. 
Um, right. So uh, there are, if you, you know, it's a long, it's a long talk, a uh, long session. If you manage to remember the following three things, uh, then I think the seminar has already been a success. There are three things I would love uh, for you guys to take away from. The first one is a bit on theory, where I would argue that business model innovation is critical for sustainability transitions, um, but not just any business model innovations, but those that really go uh, you know, that, that have quite profound changes to the dominant way of how we're doing business today, where you really have deep changes in how value is captured, um, uh, where you don't just look at profits anymore, but you're actually serious about putting uh, social benefits and economic and environmental benefits first, uh, and then just, you know, coming up with business models that also make, make that work in, in, uh, in an economical way. Uh, the second bit is that I believe uh, there are a lot of examples where innovators in sub-Saharan Africa have successfully diversified their purpose of doing business and have accordingly also changed the way how they're doing business to uh, to deliver on this value proposition of sustainable development. And they have done so, uh, interestingly enough, in quite challenging uh, circumstances, uh, which requires a lot of resilience and a lot of creativity on their side. Uh, so I think this is uh, there's some really inspirational stuff here. And the third is that, as I've uh, said at the, at the onset, I believe that these in innovators, these innovations um, imply some important lessons that, that we can learn. And by that, I mean businesses, governments, academia, all kinds of different stakeholders when we're thinking about uh, the global, uh, you know, global sustainability transitions. Uh, this is, of course, something uh, quite close to my heart, because if I look at the, uh, you know, academic literature and how we're thinking about sustainable development and sustainability transitions, the literature is very much informed, uh, of course, by cases from the global north, by thinkers from the global north. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think there's there's a lot to be learned and a lot to be gained from, from diversifying these conceptual perspectives as well. Um, right, okay. Uh, so let's go into this. Let's start with uh, with a little bit of theory. I'll try to not be too too dry here and relatively quick. And this is an image that I'm sure most of you have seen, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But for those who haven't, uh, this is Kate Rayworth's framework of donut economics, where she says that the uh, you know, the way how business and, and economy functions in the 21st century needs to be quite dramatically different from how it did function in the past. And uh, so there is kind of this sweet spot, hence the, the donut economics, where we are within a an area of resource use that ensures that there is a social foundation. Um, so we do need, of course, to consume some resources in order to deliver on, on, on healthcare, education, quality food, you know, that you can uh, kind of fulfill yourself. These, these, uh, th there's a, certainly a social foundation, but critically, there's an ecological ceiling of what the planet is able to uh, to to give us as as a society, and uh, as uh, is of course no uh, no surprise to anyone on this on the seminar is that amongst uh, you know uh, many of these environmental um, uh, uh, fields here we're we're vastly beyond what is sustainable for the planet you know the climate change issue we're seeing it uh, right now with all the heat waves the biodiversity loss land converged uh, land conversion air pollution there's not you know very good measures but it's very uh, likely that um, big cities were, were far exceeding the ecological limits there as well um different kinds of pollutions and and so forth so the way how we're doing business right now is not compatible with the planet that we have and it is something that needs to uh, quite urgently quite dramatically quite rapidly change um uh, uh, uh you know in 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 the future um here's one question already in the chat um so how do uh, you explain the ignorance of scientific community from the global north or empirical evidence from the global south uh, it's a very good question um i'm going to take it maybe i'm just going to take this one right away um just as a as a motivation i think uh, there are um very big structural inequalities in between the global north and the global south that are probably the biggest contribution factor here uh, i was on a panel at the last climate conference at cop 27 in egypt with fatima denton she is actually the chair of the united nations university in accra 
and uh, she, we, you know, we were discussing partnerships, and she said there are no eye-to-eye -eye partnerships between the global north and the global south, or specifically between Europe and Africa, um, no matter how you design them. And I thought that that was a that was such an interesting and you know quite thought-provoking point. And then she elaborated in saying because of the funding that is so skewed towards the global north, the resources are so skewed to the global north. Uh, even if you're trying to kind of balance that out, there's always this power dynamic that that is just system in, inherent uh, so uh, with all this mass of people who are really well educated in the global now north who are running the journals who are who are you know uh, kind of writing the, the impactful research uh, no matter in which field uh, this then all contributes to where this knowledge is, is coming from there so there's huge structural inequalities and and really not much that you can do about this and I asked Fatima you know what what can we do uh, and she said it's really down to solidarity, where we all have to understand that these uh, structural inequalities exist. We can fight against them, but as soon as long as we haven't overcome them, you need to be, you know, you just have to have solidarity with with those, uh, you know, parts of the world that are not uh, able to. Uh, you know, produce this, this, in this case, this, the research themselves and try to give them a platform and, you know, collaborate and make them kind of, you know, use your research money to, to kind of research their agendas and stuff like that. So, so this is something that can be done, um, but it's of course very difficult to do. Uh, and that's, you know, very short. We could have a whole whole talk just on, on this topic. Um, so let me continue here. So this is kind of the, the backdrop with the, um, uh, with the, um, uh, with the economic situation. And now in this, you know, thinking, you know, in, in the donut economic space and then this massive sustainability transitions that we need, um, there's what I really find one of uh, such, such an insightful and fantastic paper by Schotten Steinmüller, who uh, kind of looking back at almost the entire 20th century of, of uh, or the, the post Second World War, uh, uh, Second 20th century innovation, and then they're looking at what has been the key motivating factors for innovation, and they identify these three frames of innovation, and within this new, you know, sustainable development and sustainability transitions frame, they're identifying this this uh, this new frame that is currently emerging, which should be the motivation for future in innovation. In the past, uh, there was a lot on on you know R and D and and regulation, just kind of this idea that you just spend on research and development and uh, try to get the most innovative. Uh, technological solutions and then you're kind of you're winning the innovation race like you know where, wherever you spend the most research and development uh, you you get to the best uh, solutions then you kind of have to have this national consolidation with the advent of, of globalization where governments were really focused on building these national leaders you know being national leaders or you know that, that the national system is kind of becoming then a global leader of, uh, of of innovations right so like these these labels you know I'm, I'm German myself so you know the, the German engineering and the German cars and stuff like that we're kind of the world leaders and building the best cars and and then these these national systems of innovation with the entire supply chains was then really a dominant uh, policy focus uh, at the time um, but still very much follow, following a, a growth uh, you know a narrative and, and that was the, the key purpose of, of really innovation and then doing business is that you're winning this race to global Globalization. And now, given all the uh, ecological constraints that we're not within anymore uh, in the ways how we're doing business, uh, there is this third emerging frame of transformative change. And what is really interesting is that, you know, it kind of starts with this idea that you have to diversify the purpose of doing business. So it can't just be about growth and growth and growth anymore. It has to be much more diverse in terms of what what your benefits are. And there's, you know, different spectrums. There are some people who strongly still believe in, in you know, different kinds of growth. There are others that don't believe in growth and, need, you know, think we need to degrow. I don't want to get into this discussion too much, but it's certainly a lot more pluralistic on the economic side. And at the same time, uh, you then look at social and economic, uh, eco ecological impacts and try to incorporate them as core of, of, of your value proposition, as core of your, um, of, 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 you know, why you're doing business in the first place. And so the key implication for me when I read this, of course, we're all reading it kind of with our own, uh, through our own lens, I thought, wow, I mean, this is really interesting because 
uh, the, you know, what does, kind of, how does an innovation leader look like under this third frame? So, you know, looking at this from a perspective of an African entrepreneur, in terms of, you know, the second frame, national systems of innovation, how can an African entrepreneur who builds, you know, maybe like builds cars or something, how can they compete with the German car, you know, industry? This is impossible to, to have the most innovations there, or it's quite close to impossible uh, to, to have this. Um, so, you know, there's this kind of, in this frame too, you really have these global leaders and it's very hard to catch up. Now in this third frame, you could actually have innovation leaders that are, you know, really, really good at integrating social and environmental purposes into their business and, and really sustainable development without having to have this prior kind of, uh, yeah, uh, expertise, these, these decades of, of structural, um, you know, conditions that, that benefit them in terms of getting the most innovative, innovative solutions. You can be um, kind of a transformative change leader as a social entrepreneur in Ghana. Uh, so, so you you can now be this person um, if you're doing extremely well. So I thought this is a really great opportunity if we're serious about this third frame to look a lot more pluralistic of what kind of innovation leadership looks like globally, right? Um, there's been another paper um, a bit before uh, the Schottenstein Müller by Schalter and Wagner, and and they look at entrepreneurship and kind of classify different. Uh, different types of entrepreneurship and even they already said in, in 2011 I think this was um, they said that sustainable entrepreneurship kind of you know lines up with these three frames is that uh, it, if, if you want to have the sustainable entrepreneurship and if, if you're really serious about it your motivation your goals the way how you're doing business is quite significantly different from uh, traditional ways of entrepreneurship. So you really um, contribute to solving societal and env environmental problems, right? You're creating sustainable development and that's really your, your main goal. That's what you're trying to do. It's not like making shareholders happy and growing your business, but this is what you want to do and kind of trying to make it, make it happen. Uh, and again, this uh, just the premise of being a leader in these categories is just fundamentally changed and kind of opens up a window for more pluralistic uh, innovation leadership, uh, which of course I find, I find very attractive and, and uh, very interesting. Um, what I want to talk in this, or kind of want to focus a little bit in this talk, um, about is uh, specifically business model innovation. Um, of course, there's, there's tech innovation, there's uh, social innovation, there's all kinds of different uh, innovations. I have a bit of a, a focus on business model innovation because uh, I believe that business model innovation is quite salient in the Sub-Saharan African context. Um, you know, there, there are, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but there are quite big you know, sustainable development gaps and then resource gaps, infrastructural gaps of very basic services that uh, in Germany we have been fortunate enough to not really having to wor worry about, you know, electricity access or water access or quality education um, and, uh, you know, the technology behind sort of energy access or, or water access are very well known and established. Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, I think, like something like 140, 150 years ago uh, and still, you um, roughly half of sub-Saharan African uh, popul population still doesn't have access to electricity. So it's, it's you know, the technologies are known, but how do you get the technologies actually to, uh, to the people? How do you bridge the last mile? Uh, so uh, some of these questions are really critical here. And I think this concept of business models is quite helpful in understanding this uh, and also understanding the, the required kind of changes in the way how we're doing business. Um, there's different ways of, defining business models. I like this one best. I think uh, it's kind of derived from Foss and Saibi, from the seminal piece on business model innovation by Foss and Saibi. And they just look at three things. So the first one is value proposition, which is, you know, who's who's ultimately benefiting? What 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 kind of value do you create, really? And what uh, what what should come, uh, you know, your customers buy from you when when they when they get your products or services? Second is value capture. So how do you deliver on this value proposition, and how do you capture it? And the third is value networks. So which kind of partnerships, which kind of collaborations are required for you to deliver on? the value proposition that you have. And if you look at 
you know, sustainable development and, and what uh, what sustainable development entails with everything that I have just uh, introduced, um, there is this tendency or there, there is kind of, a, you know, a, at least in hypothesis, it's a bit tough to, um, to, to prove this because, you know, linking system, business models and outcomes is, is uh, empirically a little bit challenging, but there is certainly an hypothesis that you need to have quite uh, broad changes in business models in order for them to uh, go from conventional ways of doing business towards a sustainable way of doing business. And for since I call these architectural business model innovation, sorry for the abbreviation that it wasn't defined here. So BMI is it's business model innovation. Um, so changes in business model across all these three dimensions, right? Um, so, so that's uh, that's how they um, that's how they define business model innovations that are architectural in nature. And um, just to maybe illustrate this a little bit, you can think of kind of you know narrow and broad ways of of uh, of you know in changing your your business model in terms of value proposition. Right, uh, we see this quite a lot. Just keep your value proposition. And just add the word sustainable. Uh, there's a lot of uh, this question of greenwashing. We've all been there and, and sort of seen a lot of this, and there's this, so a lot of this is still ongoing. Um, and you know, some companies may have, have you know defined some targets uh, for for certain things, but then just you know, for instance, in, in uh, uh, net zero targets or, or low carbon targets, and then just get there by buying very dodgy and, and unclear carbon credits and carbon you know for for offsetting, but they don't really change their operations that much. There's a, you know a lot of examples that abound. You could also change your value proposition such that. Um, social and environmental impacts and positive social and environmental impacts are really the core of, of your business and what you're trying to do, uh, which usually takes a redefinition of, of value proposition. A value capture approach is, is similar where you can either kind of focus on your on, on, on growing your existing revenue streams and just making small changes. Um, or you can think about what other value, uh, what other ways are there to actually capture value that can be more sustainable. Um, so we're thinking about sharing models, we're thinking about servitization, uh, standardization, and, 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 and things of those in, um, nature. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the African cases there as well, uh, where companies are engaging in that. So you're really changing how you're, uh, you're you're capturing value uh, and value networks is, is another one that to scholars of uh, you know corporate sustainability and people who have been to Samanti's course I'm, I'm sure they they know this very well that the the partnerships that you're needing needing to engage um, are, are very different uh, there uh, and much deeper stakeholders that you need to engage are um, you know abound much more uh, than in traditional ways of, of doing business um, so uh, this is where we stand with the with the business model innovation and why kind of you know architectural or sometimes also called complex business model innovations are critical for sustainable development. Um, make a pause here to you know for the that's that's kind of theory done. So okay, uh, so so just uh, to to recap, we talked about donut economics. We talked about the three frames of innovation, uh, and then we talked about business model innovation and the need for broad business model innovations to be sustainable development innovate innovation leaders. Uh, are there any questions? If you want to, you can just put them into the uh, into the chat. That's currently not the case. And uh, uh, continue. You can always ask questions at any point you would like to. <clears throat> so then let's talk about um, you know sustainable development innovators in Sub-Saharan Africa specifically, and how they are managing to diversify purpose and change their ways of doing business uh, towards sustainable development. Before we do that, um, I'm just going to give a brief background. Uh, of just the context for those of you who are maybe not familiar with it. Uh, and then I sort of have, uh, you know, an, an agency and a structure kind of argument uh, about why I believe um, that there is uh, this, uh, you know, 
kind of drive for sustainable development um, in, in uh, some of the, the business models innovations that we're seeing in, in this context. Um, so I think it can be attributed to, to both. There's always this argument, you know, is it structure or is it agency, meaning that, you know, is it kind of institutions and, and the, 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 the economic situation that you're in, or is it kind of within the entrepreneurs themselves? And I think it's, it's a bit of both here. Yeah. Well, first, uh, let's just go into a bit of a background uh, looking at uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and the, the development situation right there. Um, this is a quite a telling chart, I think, where uh, you see that in you know the late, middle to late uh, 60s, um, even the European Union, but certainly China and Latin America were economically speaking, not that different from Sub-Saharan Africa. There were small gaps, um, but they were, they were certainly there. But you had you know, quite high levels of poverty in, in China and Latin America and in Sub-Saharan Africa. And even you know, post-World War II in European Union, uh, there was still uh, kind of a, you know, like a lot of room for development, I would say. And of course, the European Union grows very heavily. Its GDP per capita, we see Latin America on a steady growth trajectory. China, of course, recently really taking off, um, but Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the, the GDP per capita has pretty much stayed constant uh, for the last, you know, certainly for the last decade and a half, but even before that, you had a little bit of a growth uh, spurt in the, in the 2000s, but uh, it's just, as you can see, there's this gap between the Sub-Saharan African region and the rest of the world has really widened. So that's really one macro factor here. Another that I just listened to actually yesterday, I was listening to this uh, to this podcast and I was just blown away by, by some of the, the labor market and the population growth statistics. I mean, we all know uh, that there's a lot of population growth uh, that comes from Sub-Saharan Africa, but like the extent of which is, is, is quite mind blowing. Um, so I think uh, the time frame was until 2040, 2050 or something. Uh, and the statistics are that around, um, uh, was I think it was uh, eighty seven percent of the new uh, of of the new or kind of the, the the population growth that occurs globally is driven in sub-Saharan Africa. So that's where eighty seven percent of population growth comes from. You have a bit of population growth still in South Asia, but most other regions have kind of plateaued. Uh, or are even slightly decreasing were it not for immigration. So you really have almost the entire global population growth in the next few decades coming from this region. Uh, on top of that, you have to uh, imagine that um, in the next year, uh, there will be more people entering the labor force in Sub-Saharan Africa than in the rest of the world combined. Uh, so the average African is 19 years old, or the average Sub-Saharan African is 19 years old. In Germany, it's 46. In, in Japan, it's 49. In Spain, it was 42 or something. So there's this huge gap and this um, great, really, really big amount of people uh, that is coming into the into the labor markets um, from, from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so just some of these numbers I just uh, I find that are absolutely mind-boggling. And, and at the same time, the UN also estimates that in, in 10 years' time, um, almost 90% of people living in extreme poverty will also reside in Sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, that, that used to be a lot more balanced even 15 years ago. Um, but as extreme poverty levels have decreased in Asia specifically, and also in Latin America, but specifically in Asia, um, Africa has really kind of the, the extreme uh, poverty, people in extreme poverty have kind of you know plateaued where the reductions were kind of eaten up by population growth. Um, eventually, you know, population will also uh, plateau in Africa, but in the next few decades, there's, there's certainly this, uh, this very interesting macro shift of, of where this is coming from. Um, at the same time, you know, while population growth is 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 occurring, um, we have some of the largest sustainable development gaps uh, within the region. Uh, looking at you know prevalence of undernourishment, access to basic water services, um, and, you know, no access here or vulnerable employment shares, food loss and supply chain is just a bunch of countries where we don't have data from. But you, you really see kind of across SDGs, especially the social and economic SDGs that uh, Africa as a region is doing uh, comparably poorly. 
And um, you know, one SDG that I'm focusing a lot of my work on uh, is is the, the energy space. So the the seventh of the United Nations uh, SDGs says that we need to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. How does this stack up? Well, the price of electricity in rural Africa can be extremely expensive um, due to you know people not being connected and using uh, these uh, uh, generators, diesel generators, to uh, to to produce electricity, which is very expensive to do. Um, reliability issues are very well known, even in um, a quite well-developed economy like South Africa right now. Uh, people are suffering from immense power shortages, and every every day, actually, they're going a, a couple of hours without electricity uh, right now. So, so there, this 8.5 <laughs> power outages per month is actually a gross uh, uh, kind of underestimation of what is happening in South Africa right now. Um, Sustainability, despite the solar and the wind uh, there, uh, Africa is the region with the least uh, amount of percentage wise, so absolute, of course, but also percentage wise, least amount of renewable, uh, you know, non hydro renewable electricity installed. Um, and only 20% of Africa's electricity comes from renewables and, you know, solar and wind actually only account for roughly 4%. Uh, in Germany, I think the first half of 2023 was like 55% or something. So it's, 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 an, it's a massive, massive difference um, there uh, uh, to, to, to what we're seeing even in, in places with a lot less sunshine. And then for, uh, you know, access to electricity, uh, 580 million people are without access roughly, uh, which is more than it was in 1990. Um, uh, we do see, however, kind of a bit of a reversal in this trend from like in the last five, six years, which I believe is mainly driven by uh, off-grid energy solutions, which I will talk about later in this, in this, uh, in this call as one of the key business model innovations um, and, and tech innovations that we've seen. And, and um, you know, like you can you can see all these numbers and all these figures that I've just thrown at you. Um, when I, for me, it really hit home is when you're on field work and when you're actually looking at this uh, yourself. So I was traveling. This is in northern Uganda, and I took this picture just uh, kind of out of out of a car um, where uh, you know the road runs uh, and uh, along the road there is this uh, electricity pole and there's electricity here and electricity lines. You see all these villages here, right next to the to the grid, and um, that are not connected to electricity. The the grid just passes right over them, and you know the the reasons are 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 you know many and plenty. One of the issues is that just to step down the voltage from uh, the probably eleven kilovolts it is here to the two hundred thirty volts that you need for to power normal appliances um, is just too expensive. So people are not uh, you know are are not doing it, and the, the distribution company in Uganda is private and there's just no business case of, of, of doing it um, and so yeah it's, it's not within their business model to really focus on these rural communities and see what they can do with the electricity so a lot of them uh, go unelectrified and then kind of look at just stare at the grid um, uh, without it, uh, being connected um, there are some other examples, of course, uh, where you have uh, energy access that is being provided with uh, solar systems. So you have uh, solar mini grids or solar home systems. Solar mini grids, the, the biggest one in Uganda is on Kalangala Island. It's a relatively big one. That's a state uh, driven one uh, that also got subsidies by a number of donors where they have quite a big solar field and then chance and there's batteries there as well and they or I think a diesel generator I don't know maybe both and they they transport as just as a backup and then they transport this electricity uh, across the island to connect households and businesses um and uh, they they uh, yeah, actually, the, the connection rates on the island are higher than on the mainland because there were these uh, connection subsidies uh, available. Um, so people have electricity, and, and that's uh, you know all great and stuff, um, and then uh, you know allows people to do uh, you know especially in the households allows them to to enjoy um, you know entertainment and have light at night and and, and things of those nature. But then if you look at the fish logistics in Kalanga, it kind of looks like this, right? Uh, so you have this, this motorcycle and, um, 
uh, you know, this guy carrying this large fish here on his on on, on the back of his motorcycle, uh, which of course is not a very sustainable way uh, of transporting fish. There are almost no coal chains between Kalangala and Kampala, uh, despite fish being the main or you know one of the key commodities uh, in Kalangala. It's it's, it's an island region. Um, that isn't even that far from Kalangala, uh, from 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 the capital city Kampala. It's in Lake Victoria, um, and uh, as a result of this absence of cooling, um, fishermen who you know uh, who who uh, who catch fish, they're really price takers. You really don't have an option um to uh to to keep the fish for as long as you want because you really have to sell otherwise it just goes bad so whatever price you're being offered by traders you pretty much have to take which is uh, one key reason why uh, these fishermen are not uh you know are just barely kind of getting by with their income and then are really price takers and really have to take whatever is being offered to them and another issue is that up to 35 percent of fish is lost on on this journey because it just goes bad um you know it depends of course on temperature humidity and, and stuff but these are some of the maximum figures that that you can have on a given day um so this is then kind of the the background within which i'm studying innovations and entrepreneurs and have been doing this and um the first argument that i want to make is is one of agency and, and just uh, kind of thinking about african entrepreneurs themselves um and uh, i think it would be a crime for me to just explain this to you this is why i have this uh, video prepared of by one of the entrepreneurs that uh, that i've been quite inspired by this is andrew santongo i'll try to play this video it might be a little bit silent when we when we just tried it in the uh, you know ahead of the seminar so maybe you just need to crank up the sound on your on your laptop or headphones i hope that this can work let me know in the chat if there's any any issues my name is andrew sentongo and uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you i'm an entrepreneur um, by background and i develop renewable energy here in uganda so i want to talk to you about um innovation or having an innovative business model and everything i'm going to say is sort of accidental we've never really set out to um with a very clear platform that this is what we are going to do but things have rather evolved along the way during the course of our 10-year journey so we started out about five years ago to seriously develop um solar off-grid energy and we uh building mini grids so we build mini grids for isolated island communities in um, lake victoria which is a predominant water body here in my country uganda so our first approach was to set up the power generation uh, you know obtain some subsidies from development partners from the government and purely focus on selling electricity well it has its challenges it's not um, <clears throat> quite a straightforward um, approach as you may hear me s speak about it but we sort of started to evolve and look into the productive use side of off-grid solar. So we stumbled across an interesting problem of cold chain because the areas we primarily serve depend on fishing. And there was a very big gap in uh, the, the, the cold chain. So we looked at how we can bundle cold chain with that solar energy. And actually it was more commercially um, successful than focusing only on the mini grid side of things. So we currently run uh, two cold chain plants in the islands where we um, produce flake ice for the local fishermen. So they are able to move their fish, they are able to avoid wastage, and we are also able to earn money from that. So in general, yeah, innovation um, is really um, it, it can't be structured from a textbook approach, but rather um, it has to be allowed to evolve. It has to be allowed to sort of uh, one thing flip into the other. So, yeah, and it calls for an open mindset. It also calls for trying new things. It also calls for being able to be patient and being able to also absorb um, certain things, certain challenges that come along the way. And there are so many of those. So I need to keep the video short, but I hope that um, my contribution has been helpful to you. 
and um, I look forward to getting in touch again. Bye-bye. I wish you a good day or a good afternoon. Lovely. Okay. I hope. Yeah. Thanks for the for the feedback. There uh, seems to be quite clear. So so uh, really, what what Andrew is talking about the three things that I that I find fascinating. I mean, there's many things that, that I find fascinating. But the first one is um, his uh, his idea of bundling things together. So it's, it's a bit almost counterintuitive, right? Where you are in a situation where. Uh, it's very challenging to even do one thing. He's saying, okay, let me actually bundle the electricity and then also use that for productive source for, for, for productive uses, in this case, cold chain, and kind of run the energy side of things and then also run a cold chain uh, business. And by combining the two, by turning the electricity into ice and then selling the ice to the fishermen, not only can the fishermen then uh, use this ice uh, to to cool their fish and and reduce wastage. Uh, it also helps him, you know, Andrew in this case, to kind of you know increase the value added of his mini grid operations and and sort of overcome some of the financial challenges of uh, uh, just pretty providing electricity in the first place. So so this idea of bundling um, is one that we're seeing over and over and over and over again, where kind of, you know, they're, they're really doing this, this impossible task, a lot of these entrepreneurs and taking two, three, four challenges and kind of coming up with a business model that when you put these four challenges together, you get one solution that works across all these challenges, uh, which I think, you know, if, you, if you're managing to do that, that's, that's a really great form of creativity. The other, the second part that I wanted to mention is, one of resilience. Um, I'm not talking too much about this uh, in, 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 in this talk. I could, though, uh, doing a research project on resilience right now. And uh, just hearing Andrew speak, uh, speak, I think, is really, you know, all these challenges, he just hints at them. But, you know, he kind of hits this roadblock and he hits another and he hits another and he has to kind of then adapt his business model and think about what he can do. Um, and doing all of that with very limited uh, support that he has, uh, you know, for, for him and, and just, but, but then being this resilient and just kind of not just quitting the idea when the mini grid itself didn't work and when, you know, this and that didn't work, but just kind of, you know, continuing to do it, continue to try to innovate and, and take the time that is necessary and be this persistent um, is, 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 I think, something that, that is very remarkable. And the third point is what, what I believe is kind of underpinning this resilience and this idea of bundling, this idea of trying to get all these impacts is that Andrew is very much kind of entrenched in the communities that he's working with. And he has a very deep motivation to drive sustainable development in these communities. And that's something that I'm also seeing with, you know, most of the very in, uh, innovative entrepreneurs, just how they talk. They very seldom talk about themselves and trying to pitch their, you know, of course they need to pitch them, you know, their, their, their business models and, and, you know, get funding for it. But the way how they talk about impact is very much kind of aligned to these sustainable development ideas that we, that we all share. And it's something that they naturally talk about. It's not something that, oh, you know, they're doing this to, for, for that a business works, but it's really a core part of what they believe the purpose of their business is. And I think, you know, these, these three things kind of come out in this talk. So let me just kind of summarize a little bit what, uh, what this business model is that Andrew talks about. In the traditional off-grid or mini-grid approach, you have, you know, some mini-grid and that connects houses or you know, at a school or something, and you meet energy needs in remote areas, right? And that's, that's, that's a really good and great uh, impact to, uh, to, to have. Um, the value capture approach is you just kind of, you know, raise money by build a mini grid and then sell electricity to these households. Um, you can do that with a few collaborators that you need, but not, not that many. It's, it's relative. I mean, you know, I say that a mini grid could probably kill me for saying this, but it's relatively straightforward. It's not, but, you know, given, given in the circumstances, uh, and by comparison, it is. Now, what Andrew is doing is, okay, let me actually not only do mini grids but let me do a fish you know this ice uh, cold chain as well and this is a picture of, of one of the trucks that he's using so he has his ice he has these crates of fish 
Um, he even, uh, I think, rented out a couple of trucks here as well. And then he creates more, you know, development in these awkward areas. He still has the energy side, but now he's addressing hunger because, uh, you know, uh, and then nutrition, um, because fish is, of course, a very nutritious um, uh, food. And uh, by wasting less of it, uh, you, you're able to feed more people. Um, poverty, uh, some of the fishermen are now able to not be price takers, but actually negotiate prices and be part of, uh, you know, cooperative structures where they have a much more steady income um, you provide decent jobs within the uh, within the cold chain you reduce um, uh, food waste and of course this is a solar uh, solar system now uh, so of course on, on the climate side you're also having positive impacts and the way how he does it is uh, through a servitization approach um, and I'll talk about that on, on the next slide with quite elaborate uh, elaborate partnership and you know, a quite elaborate not a publisher network. So, how does this servitization work? So, the idea is, and you know, just bear with me, these numbers are illustrative, but this is kind of how it looks like. The idea is that you're not only building a mini grid where you have you know certain generation of electricity and you sell that to households, you're also building a cooling facility. It turns out that the cooling facility itself is not much more expensive. It doesn't really increase your capex that much. It increases a little bit, increases a little bit the OPEX. Well, now you have 15 megawatt hours in this illustrative example that you can use for ice production. And now the ice, every kilowatt hour that you put into ice is much more valuable economically speaking, and also across these other sustainable development uh, impacts, than it is to just sell kind of, you know, an, a kilowatt hour for, for lighting, because now you can, uh, you know, sell the ice, fish doesn't go bad, the income increases for, farm, for, for, for fishermen because less uh, food waste, and they're not price takers anymore, and the quality of the fish is, is better, right, when it's cooled versus when it's being transported on, on, on these motorcycles. So that in turn, if you kind of do the math, the value value of each kilowatt hour that you put into ice is actually five times, four to five times uh, what it is if you just sell it to households and, and you know, for, for, for lighting or something like that. So you increase quite massively the revenue, the overall revenue, and, uh, you know, it's still challenging to recover cost in, in kind of a scalable manner, but you're much closer to it uh, than you could be in this model where just the, the amount of money that people can pay for electricity will never recover your, your capex and your overall is kind of reliant on, on subsidies so that's just kind of this this idea where two wrongs kind of you know the poor energy situation and the poor cold chain and the food waste kind of make a right uh, and, and and that's uh, that's quite fascinating in terms of the value network innovation um, you have, I mean, this is all the, the upstream and downstream stuff, which is quite the standard, you know, financing product and installation. I don't want to go into that, but there's a lot of stuff that he does in terms of diversifying value, spreading the value, monetizing the value where you have to, um, because this is a servitization approach where he actually owns the ICE unit and sells ICE. So he sells, he doesn't sell kilowatt hour. Um, hours, he sells kind of kilo, kilograms of ice, right? So he sells cooling as a service, if you want. Um, and so in order to do that, you need to uh, kind of have some kind of finance here uh, as well uh, that that allows you to incur these higher uh, capex. Um, you need to have uh, kind of, you know, customer acquisition that goes a lot deeper because you're not just in this one business, but you need to understand the whole cold chain as well. A mobile money solution provider. So you, the, the payments structures become easier. Um, you know, all, all these different things that you need to do here is, is quite, quite complex. Complex. So if, if all of those things kind of then come together, uh, you have these, these you know, complex or architectural business model innovation uh, where you can deliver sustainable development um, across different dimensions. Um, and one cool thing is kind of that, um, uh, that uh, the fundraising by startups in Africa um, is really heating up. So in 2015, the total money raised for startups in Africa was 55 million, which is, you know, kind of a normal series B, series C something funding for one Silicon Valley company, right? Like that's, that's what the entire kind of market did in 2015. In 2022, it took, I think, seven weeks to reach a billion. Um, there was, uh, because of the energy crisis here and the global kind of economic crisis, uh, a bit of a turndown, but this turndown was actually a lot smaller than in other regions. And now Africa, for the first time, is actually not the, 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 the um, uh, is not the, uh, 
the, the kind of the, the bottom region, but South America, is, so Sub-Saharan Africa actually overtook South America in terms of startup finance, and uh, you have very, very high growth rates. Um, uh, there's a question whether this, uh, uh, whether this graph contains uh, inflation. I actually don't know, to be honest. You would have to look at the big deal there. Um, and of course, for 2023, the impact would be quite big. For the other years, inflation was relatively low, and we're just looking at a three-year or four-year time span. So for those years, even if it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, wouldn't have much of an impact. Uh, here, you would have a little bit of an impact. So that's a that's a good question. Thanks, Christian. Um, great. Okay. And then I wanted to talk about. Um, structure and i think you know we, we talked about the creativity there's there's another a really interesting bit on uh, on 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 structure and kind of the 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 the, the circumstances within which innovators in africa have to have to innovate for sustainable development um what I want to, I kind of want to use the case of circularity and circular business models as a case. Um, this slide here, or some variation to it, or, you know, of it might be familiar to to many of you. Where the idea is that we're moving from uh, the current linear economy to a circular economy, where we are using um, stuff that uh, kind of, you know, uh, across the value chains where we're, where we are not just throwing away stuff, where we're trying to reduce waste by closing, slowing and narrowing resource loops. Uh, and we want to retain value, right? We can repair, we can reuse, we can refurbish, remanufacture, recycle, um, such that the, the material flows just not all just end up in, in you know, waste uh, fills and, and, and stuff of that matter in the ocean, um, uh, but that actually keep it within the within the uh, the economic cycle um um uh, the interesting thing is that i mean this the circularity is certainly something that people have been talking about more and more um i just recently had a conversation with um a senior executive from one of the biggest uh, startup uh private equity funds in europe and i asked him you know how big are kind of sustainable startups and sustainable solutions and circularity and he said yeah it's i mean it's, it's really a niche thing still uh, i mean it's coming and you, you see some cool some cool things but in terms of overall funding in the startup space you still have kind of you know all these platform apps and the you know the blockchains and you know all these these kind of tech enabled uh, matchmaking things uh, and then of course now with ai at the advent of an ai the, these are really the the big startup drivers and in terms of sustainability um it's it's relatively limited still um so this is kind of the you know how we've been thinking about circular business models and and the core kind of i mean you correct me if i'm if i'm wrong here but my understanding is from the global north and how we're conceptualizing uh, this and this was written here by by after uh, after berg and nancy bocken who's one of the um she's at, at maastricht and one of uh, you know a very decorated and brilliant scholar in terms of sustainable supply chains as uh, sorry so the sustainable business model innovation and uh, here we have this idea of retaining value right like this is one of the the, the key kind of uh uh, ideas behind it is, is certainly an ec environmental uh, one where we say, you know, uh, there, there's some economic kind of benefits or co-benefits, but it's certainly mainly driven by economic, uh, sorry, environmental uh, concerns. If we look at this from an African perspective, um, I think it's uh, it's it's uh, very interesting and, and kind of a little bit broader and also like different drivers that we see in terms of what circular business models are being driven by in Africa. I just brought a couple of case examples here um, where we again see this this theme where circularity is not kind of something uh, that is implemented to solve an environmental problem only, but it's rather one where it can be a solution to solving different sustainable development problems at the same time. And many times they're actually economic or social, socioeconomic in nature. And just giving you, you know, three examples here from uh, from from three different uh, entrepreneurs, and I could could give many more. Uh, Border Work is a company in Uganda that use um, secondhand motorcycles uh, and refurbish them with electric 
um, with electric an electric motor and a Ugandan made battery and the you know and, and that's actually really cool because of you know air pollution uh, that that really goes down um, and there's quite expensive fuel that these drivers uh, uh, are, are relying to and they have to pay for um, it's actually much more efficient and cost effective for drivers to use electricity for motorcycles especially for these light vehicles electrification is just much cheaper for them um, and then at the same time what they're also doing is that they use these batteries in you know their e-mobility for maybe three to five years and then as capacity of the battery goes down they're not as fit for mobility anymore as at the beginning but then they're not just throwing the the, the battery away they have standardized it in a way that they can then actually give it into households and use it for household applications and also productive use applications like uh, you know hair clippers or smoldering or you know some whatever kind of uh, electric you know appliance you can think of um that is kind of semi-portable so you can carry the battery still but you're not like driving around with it all the time and then maybe after 10 or 12 years uh, the the battery capacity will have further decreased but then they just use them as stationary power banks so for instance in in a in an off-grid energy system run with solar they don't buy one new battery but just hook up like five of these old ones in series and then you kind of have the same uh, capacity there and once they have reached their absolute end of life they then um, deassemble the products and uh, recycle as much as they can um, so that's that's the idea and you see how many different SDGs uh, they're they're addressing with this uh, uh, with this approach and also the fact that they're using secondhand motorcycles that are already there in, in Uganda rather than just try, throwing new ones on the market um, is, is also one that can be considered circular. Uh, Mandulis is another really interesting example they're an off-grid energy company uh, mainly operating in Uganda and um, uh, here they have, you know, there's there's these problems that people don't have access to electricity, farmers have low incomes, and they have high amounts of, of uh, agricultural and, and farm waste. And what they're then doing, they're building, they, they've built these mini grids that they combine with biogasification, where you can turn your farm waste uh, into electricity through the biogasification. And an interesting approach is that as a farmer, you can actually pay for your electricity with your waste that you're bringing so you create an incentive for the farmers to come in and and, and bring their waste um and so you kind of get electricity for free or i don't know it's a subsidy maybe they still end up paying a little bit of a price but they they have uh, you know a subsidized rate and at the same time they're also producing these burnable pellets uh, you know these hard pellets that you can use for for cooking uh which then also avoids you know having to cut down trees firewood collection which has a whole range of the social and you know especially also women and children are really engaged with that uh, development uh, benefits where you don't have to do that anymore. So you're again having uh, all these great SDG and very diverse SDG uh, impacts from, from kind of this integrated model. Uh, another one is um, Biomac from Mozambique, where the company is collecting plastic waste from the oceans and from the coastlines. And Mozambique is, is an island, right? So it's surrounded by a lot of plastic waste, unfortunately. But they're turning uh, this plastic into uh, um, prosthetics, which are very hard to come by, very expensive in, in Mozambique. Um, but these are locally made. And uh, yeah, they're, they're, they've... Uh, now made uh, you know kind of solve this problem of prosthetics uh, access um, here. Uh, so so you see how all of these ones have different SDG impacts. Um, and um, so what we then did, or rather a PhD student of mine, Lukas Straub, is at Utrecht University. Uh, he's been looking at um, sort of the, the academic literature of anything that he could find related to circularity in the global uh, south. Uh, he's still working on this paper and the analysis are ongoing, um, but I just wanted to bring you some preliminary result, results. And one of the things that he's looked at is kind of the micro drivers of circularity and uh, uh, what is driving circularity in the global south. And I think there are some points here that are quite different from the global north. So you have um, these imminent development needs and really, you know, scarcity of resources. Of course, there's some environmental impacts as well, but I would say it's, it's mostly those two that really drive these companies to do something with the scarce resources. Um, a really interesting case is, for instance, the supply chains within, um, uh, you know, food supply chains within uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, when you compare them to Europe, um, most of the food waste in Sub-Saharan Africa occurs 
is kind of between farm and fork, but not at the consumer level anymore. Consumers usually don't throw away a lot of food, whereas in, in Europe is the exact opposite. Like, you know, we throw away and retail markets throw away so much food, you know, 20, 20, 20 or something. And that's kind of the same number that gets lost in the supply chain. So the overall food waste in uh, or food loss in, in, in kind of Europe and Africa is similar, but it occurs at very different stages. So uh, kind of this, this these, these, these imminent needs, um, uh, together with uh, some kind of these, these uh, yeah, there, there are some enablers and barriers, but I don't want to go into those too much because we're a bit low on time. Um, but but what what these uh, these needs and the scarcity of resource really do is they really make this issue of you know having to use resources in a in a uh, in a sustainable way and you know as much and, and as often and closing those loops as you can really is 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 uh, is is without an alternative you don't really have other ways of doing it so then um you really create uh, circular solutions that uh, are, are many many of them are largely informal right you have um, quite resource efficient smes because it's just too expensive to throw away resources you have a large market for second hand goods and you have much more kind of a culture of these are kind of needs driven right I don't want to romanticize this it's not like you know oh they're so circular and this is also fantastic there's a lot of poverty driven issues here um but what we're seeing is that the kind of the, the understanding of of the need for circularity is 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 bigger they are of course not calling it like that but but that's kind of where uh, where we're where we're coming out and then there's of course new businesses that are also trying to use these circular solutions to then solve sustainable development uh, problems and the impacts are often economic and social of course they're environmental as well but what these companies are trying to get that are often economic and social impact so you know just comparing that to circular economy principles that we have in the global north i think it, it really widens uh, some of the uh, some of the impacts and some of the drivers for for circularity um one Final example before I go to the last uh, bit of the talk um, is something uh, that that I wanted to bring your attention to uh, is, uh, is is this uh, really interesting case of, of um, Indomie noodles. Uh, it's a it's a noodle company, um, you know, an instant noodle company from Nigeria. And what they are what they are doing really is uh, you know that they're originally um, uh, they're originally kind of. Uh, just wanting to sell a pack of noodles but then they found out that in Nigeria you can't really do that because you really don't have good logistics infrastructure you don't have reliable electricity and water uh, you have to think about agriculture and even you know kind of international su supply logistics um, uh, and and you have an education and skills and stuff like that so they ended up you know doing all of these things all at the same time just to kind of deliver a low cost and you know nutritious meal to to nigerian households and uh, um if also jomo does a, a great job in this in this youtube talk of explaining all the different things that that have to happen in order for indomie to succeed at that and they're really this integrated developer where they're solving they kind of need to solve you know six seven sdgs first before they can actually sell some noodles so so it's, it's really i mean solve you know contributing to solve of course um but but it's it's, it's a really interesting case of uh of, of you know doing uh, doing business and then how much and how deep you are um daniel has a question as we work on end of life batteries from electric vehicles um do you know if recycling capacities in uganda are sufficient to handle the flow the waste flows that's a very very good question and 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 they're not uh, you know thanks daniel for for actually making me you know uh, Yes, Indomie is from Indonesia. That's that's true. Um, but they're they're selling. Uh, they have kind of this this Nigerian um, subsidiary. Thanks for that. Um, just on the uh, on the on the recycling capacity. So so that's absolutely not the case that they have sufficient um, recycling capacities. There's a lot of informal recycling going on, which sounds really kind of you know again like you know romantic and great and sustainable. Um, but the reality is that it's a deeply unsustainable practice because if you maybe you've seen these. Uh, the, 
like there's documentaries on these large e-waste uh, um, uh, you know landfills from Ghana where people just go around and burn stuff without pr protective gear to get, extract some precious metals from the e-waste and then this hard, very very poisonous and very hazardous uh, way of, of, of circularity but they would even go to these extremes to recycle right which is uh a, a, again i mean it's uh, I, I don't want to um uh, you know suggest that that's that that's the way how you need to recycle but um what what is the case there is that the resource scarcity is so salient and the development needs and, and the you know economic needs and social needs of people are so great that they that they don't just let stuff just lie around that could be of value and even go to to these extremes and uh, Daniel's question here uh, this is also I mean there there are a couple of companies now who are doing it and there's certainly a large informal sector um, but but uh, in order to really do this at scale uh, you would have to um, be, be a lot bigger and probably also engage in some kind of formalization uh, could be a bottom-up kind of formalization activity to 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 really build this out. Um, <clears throat> okay, any other questions from from this part? It's currently not the case. And let me just spend maybe five minutes on on the lessons that we can learn from these sustainability leaders. Um, talk about business uh, businesses first. Um, you know what what I believe there, there are really two things um uh, that that we can learn in in the global north from this. The one thing is that I actually don't believe that there's a big difference in terms of the the intensity or the 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 yeah the 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 intensity of the impacts that we're causing with our way of doing business uh, in 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 the global north um compared to those you know, very salient development needs that we have in the global south, um, because what we're doing here in the global north, it's just like the linkage is just not as clear and it's it's kind of not as much in your face. But we've just learned that in the heat wave of 2022, 60,000 people died, right? You may have seen that, uh, that that analysis is 60,000 people um, just from, from, from those heat waves that are made much more um, likely by climate change uh, there was the first attribution study done um, by by Federico Otto's team uh, uh, that said that this heat wave in the Horn of Africa is the first one where they actually said uh, that this would have not occurred without climate change before that they always said you know it was made much more likely um, not always like in, in some of them uh, you know was made much more likely through climate change now we have heat waves and droughts in the Horn of Africa that would have not uh, occurred uh, through cli without climate change, and it's certainly not the people in the Horn of Africa that caused climate change. So it's really our decisions and our, you know, what we did in the past, what we're doing today, that is effectively, you know, killing people uh, through through droughts and making people losing, uh, lose lose their livelihoods. And so the 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 graveness of the impacts are there as well in the Western world, they're just not as kind of as openly seen by by people. And what we're learning from the, the global South context is that where there are imminent needs, people tend to be more innovative to try to solve these needs, right? In German, we say Not macht erfinderisch. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, kind of if, if you are kind of in, in need, you're trying to kind of innovate your way out of it. So it can be a driver for for innovation if we are able to you know, work even more on communicating the dire consequences, not only of climate change, of biodiversity loss, of, of all these things. Uh, and, and so to see this, this massive movement that we had in the last three, four, five years, where this has really been uh, brought to the forefront of public and global discussions, I, I think this is a key uh, kind of, uh, um, yeah, mechanism of, of uh, underlining the urgency that we have to do something and that can really drive innovation. Uh, and then the other thing is just like, you know, sometimes I'm just like, uh, just it's, it's just a source of inspiration of you know the creativity and resilience hearing you know Andrew talk and all these other uh, entrepreneurs uh, that, that I've engaged with I had the pleasure of engaging with talking you know and then the, the resilience uh, that they have and the creativity that they have that they succeed in these uh, circumstances uh, where they where they have where the structural uh, disadvantages compared to a place like Germany are, are undeniable uh, I think this should be motivation for for you know uh, us here at home that we can also do a lot more than than what we're doing right now so this is kind of for, for from a business perspective some of the 
some of the uh, things that I would like to say. And it's, you know, like seeing them as, as an inspiration and, you know, source of creativity is, is kind of goes in this uh, in this realm that it's almost, you know, this whole thing is it's too late to be pessimistic and we have to look at uh, how, you know, what, what, what can be, you know, positive examples and communicate those positive examples and look for solutions rather than looking for problems. I think that's actually what Robert Habeck said yesterday at the FTH Aachen or a few days back he was there. That, that's what he said. And, and I, re I really like that looking for solutions more than for problems. Um, on the policy side, uh, let me just be very, very brief here. So what, what we have done, um, we've studied these entrepreneurs in Africa, um, in six sub-Saharan African countries, and wanted to understand which kind of policies are actually, you know, kind of favorable for business model innovation. Uh, so that's also something that we can, that we can learn, but how policy can, you know, can work in, in these circumstances where we've had kind of these complex business model innovation for sustainable development. And what we found here is that you have to have policy mixes that include sector specific policy strategies and policy instruments, but also society wide ones. So the sector specific, for instance, in the energy sector, these are kind of the, if, if you want the, the, the carrot, where you uh, provide long term foundation and implement supportive conditions where you draw a lot of companies into a sector. Um, uh, so that innovation can occur, but then you have these societal constraints where, uh, for instance, in the case of off-grid energy in Uganda, it's like, you know, you can't just charge high tariffs, they need to be affordable. So then companies are drawn in because it's supportive, but then they also have these clear bounds and say, okay, we can't charge these high tariffs, what can we do to actually uh, do this for, you know, that, that it is affordable as well, and then they, you know, are kind of pressured towards uh, um, uh, innovation. Um, and uh, the key thing is then that you kind of balance the the, the carrot and the stick uh, out. If you have too much carrot, uh, for instance, if you just give subsidies and subsidies and subsidies to companies, they will just take the subsidies and don't. They, there's no need for them to innovate anymore. But if you um, if you just do you know stick 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 all the time, of course you kind of kill innovation uh, before it really starts. So there's there's really delicate balance and some fascinating examples here that I won't go into now. Where kind of if the international community kind of comes in. And, and they can really distort this balance and, and shifting it to either one side or the other too much and, and be quite harmful for, for innovation. Um, all right, there's another question here uh, by, um, by Idel, just one second. So resource scarcity as a driver for innovation in Africa also means that price mechanisms in, the, uh, in other parts of the world don't reflect resource scarcity properly. Um, you would probably have to explain that to me again. That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, yes, in now I got it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Yes. So uh, that, that's one of the key issues that a lot of these uh, externalities are, you know, are externalities because they're not costed in. So it doesn't really cost you much um, to pollute the planet. It doesn't, you know, in, in, you can you can fly without paying taxes for it. Uh, you know, there's no kerosene tax. So so uh, the, the the way that you can, you know, or biodiversity loss and so all of that doesn't cost you anything. Whereas in the sub-Saharan African context, um, there are very hard costs with because resources are scarce, so they're they're more expensive. So that's a very good point. Edel. It's, it's exactly one of the one of the issues uh, that that are there and and that you have to solve is kind of you know internalize these these externalities and if you want to solve these these issues at least you know kind of judging from this from this uh, context so, so that's very uh, <clears throat> so that's a very good comment thank you very much um tobias is asking uh, how can we transfer circular business models from sub-saharan africa to, you know what let me let me maybe actually just I'll, let me just uh, kind of collect these questions here i just have two more slides and then we can go into the into this discussion and Samanti uh, and uh, maybe can moderate um if that's okay to be us and uh, prashant um, i'll just take two more minutes um because i really only have one slide left um so what does this mean for academia i kind of had to sneak that sneak that that slide in because i think we can learn so much also from an academic point of view from these uh from these innovators and because they are so underrepresented these countries in our theory building and sustainability transitions and sustainability corporate management uh, that i think you know just looking at these contexts very quickly you can challenge some of the most fundamental fundamental 
um, frameworks and theories that we're operating with in uh, in in the sustainability transitions. Uh, so you know, many of you will have seen Hale's wonderful and a very impactful work on on his multi level perspective, where he says that niche innovations occur and then they uh, kind of disrupt socio technical regimes um, to form new socio technical regimes and eventually uh, kind of influence the socio technical landscape. Where I would challenge this, and there's there's many like from an African perspective where you can challenge this is what this kind of implicitly says that you have a socio-technical regime that is dynamically stable and he defines this as you know markets industry policy technology culture if you look at the off-grid energy sector in africa like which technologies were there before that happened which policies were there before that happened which industry was there before that happened culture there's a lot right science uh, also, markets, user preferences. A lot of this is informal, and some of this is is uh, just hasn't really been been there. There are, you know, these institutional voids uh, that, that people are talking about in in the literature. So this premise of you know socio technical regime disruption is maybe incomplete if you look at these uh, at these cases. It's more like a formation and and quite different dynamics at play. Um, I haven't seen any research on this, but this is just one idea that I would like to pursue at some point. Uh, circular business models, I talked about this, you know, that we we're talking a lot about retaining value, but this is actually much more about diversifying value in the in the global south and, and getting, you know, socioeconomic development and so, so being much broader in terms of the impact that we have from circularity. And then just very classic kind of operations research problems like traveling salesmen. There's been tons of research on this, on, on how you solve the traveling salesman problem. But if you just look at this in the African context, like these are these are like cities or towns, and these are you know areas and ways between them, and they just assume that uh, you know all these these uh, ways are just always there and they're connected and they have a certain length or a cost. Well, what if you know this is a dirt road or something, and then there is some kind of rain season and the dirt road just goes for two months, right? And uh, and that's a situation that never really occurs or very rarely occurs. Uh, in the global north, whereas in, in Africa, it's quite common in, in rural areas. So some of the underlying um, assumptions of the traveling salesman problem, which is, you know, one of the most fundamental in operations research, doesn't even hold if you if you look at it in terms of an African perspective. Great. Um, there are some questions coming in. Um, uh, so just uh, to, to summarize the key messages we had uh, business model innovations i argue are key for sustainability transitions but require deep changes um, to capturing value and multi-dimensions i talked about the innovators in sub-saharan africa and both their structure and the agency that helps them to innovate and diversify the purpose of what they're doing and ways of doing business for sustainable development uh, and then i talked a little bit about the lessons learned for businesses so with that, I'll pause a little bit, and maybe let Samanti come in. Thank you very, very much for your, for your attention. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Philip, uh, for sharing all of those details and already answering a couple of questions on the go. Um, like you already said there, and in the process, there are two more questions. Now. Um, oh, I will take the time, I'll read them out to you and then you can take the time to answer them. So the first one is from Tobias and he's asking, how can we transfer circular business models and circular practices from Sub-Saharan Africa to high income countries within your economies? Yeah. That's a that's a very good, that's a very good question, and of course, um, the the answer is that you can't really transfer the um, uh, the. Uh, the, the you know the, the context one to one because of course it's it's so different um but what I do think can be transferred are some lessons learned there that uh, uh, circular so one one is certainly that and and then operationalizing kind of these lessons so one is that circularity does a lot more than just have positive environmental benefits it can have positive social benefits positive economic uh, benefits and and uh, you know it if especially in a context where we value and as as Eden I think said uh, as we kind of price in the real cost of resource use and you know resource destruction uh, then we see an empirical evidence that the conservation efforts uh, are a lot higher 
than they are currently where these price mechanisms for instance are not priced in where these uh, uh where, where the resources are not priced as scarcely as they actually should be as they actually are right um uh, so uh, it, it gives this really nice empirical evidence for policies uh, here that that would internalize some of these some of these costs and it, can, it might give you some ideas of how some of these uh, um, mechanisms can function of course there's a big caveat of course you know structurally it's very very different to do something like this in Germany or or in Ghana I am very well aware of that but it is I think kind of empirically speaking one interesting point to 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 consider uh, and and certainly something that hasn't been explored enough and and uh, you know so so I think that there are some some of these um, more kind of abstract findings uh, that that we can see and that then could potentially translate. The one thing that I do say is that I, I have to caution here. I mean, Lucas is writing this paper together with uh, with me and another colleague, and uh, this is our you know from our reading is kind of the first time that somebody's looking at this circularity issues in the global south uh, in that much detail which is I mean, kind of a crime in itself right like you know there's so much circular develop circular economy uh, conceptualization um uh, in the literature and uh, as i've just tried to illustrate and, and lucas has done such a phenomenal job in, in illustrating i think in his work is that it can be quite different from 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 sub-saharan africa so what the impl from, uh, from from the global north so what the implications are of it uh, let's see and let's have some research projects on that so it's kind of i have to caution you on that a little bit. Thank you, Philip. And then um, we have two more questions at this point. So the next one is from Prashant. And he asks, uh, what could be priority or gap filling for sustainable entrepreneurship development in Africa? Is that government innovation focused policy or defending startup initiatives in, in the energy sector, sector specific? And promoting sustainable entrepreneurship in Africa? So that's, yeah, that's an excellent question. And um, it's it's uh it's it's one where I would have a hard time ranking sort of uh, different different uh, things that would have to happen. Um, one thing certainly is that uh, there needs to be more access to cheap capital, and uh, in in a way that you fund um, that you fund kind of problem or you know that, that you fund companies that have developed their own solutions to a certain problem so where you don't where you don't say you know i have this policy goal of solving you know i don't know like energy access right and then you you say if you connect a household you get 300 dollars per household that's how, what the world bank did right so that's kind of what what our idea was so you know how can we do private sector off-grid energy the trouble with that is that you're really forcing companies into one specific kind of solution you know and then they just connect households and then the households are connected they get the money and then they don't really care about it anymore uh, but then the research shows that if you just connect the household to electricity I mean electricity does nothing for you right you can die of it if you touch it right but without appliances there is no utility in you in, in in energy right so you have to think a lot bigger what what energy is um, so uh, and a lot of the entrepreneurs I think have actually understood this a lot better than the than the development community so giving them more freedom in terms of the solutions that they want to solve rather than kind of being very prescriptive and very risk averse uh, is is one really important thing and and pouring this this risk capital in uh really interesting thing i'm, I'm working with the with the giz uh, right now on startup uh, finance and on our startup accelerator in in africa uh, and there you know it's, it's one of the only programs that actually does this so you know they they're fantastic people it's really really cool work that they're doing the one slight uh, you know issue uh, that that i would have and i think they may, may have it with themselves they have had now five rounds of, of startup finance and they have financed 10 startups so it's 50 startups that have gone through that program and now you know a few years after still 48 of these startups exist which sounds great right but it's actually really bad because uh startups as we know in germany 85 percent of startups fail and there's a good reason for it because you know these startups innovation ideas are very risky and if you want to get the unicorn, the next unicorn, the next really big thing, it's something that people don't envision. Because by definition, if everybody was envisioning that, it wouldn't be a unicorn anymore. So you have to be prepared to fail, uh, which 
you know, the development organizations carrying, they have this risk capital, it's taxpayers' money, they could use it, but they're not, they're very conservative. If they're doing it at all, they're very conservative with kind of funding these entrepreneurial ecosystems. And I think there needs to be more risk capital uh, and it needs to be available, you know, to, 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 to these ecosystems and, and really not believing that there isn't anything on the ground. There are a lot of great structures on the ground, but kind of, you know, give the, give the agency a little bit more to, to those people who actually understand the context. I think that's probably the, the first thing that I would uh, that I would say is, is on the finance side, and of course, then policy, right? Like you know, there's a lot of other things that you need to do as well. So thanks for that question. Thank you, Philip. And then we have one more, and uh, with regard to the time, also the last question from Christian. Oh, there's one. Uh, Matthias just back one in, so we'll take those three questions and um, and end with those. So Christian is asking, what role do you see for international cooperation in the context of African innovativeness, both for political development policy and for B two B? And business to business partnerships. Yeah, that's an excellent question, and there there is certain, certainly. Uh, a, a huge role for international corporations um, to, to do that, and uh, we're, we're seeing it actually in the off-grid energy sector. Some of uh, you know very innovative uh, companies uh, in in Africa have been uh, in, in 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 Uganda, for instance, have been bought by Engie, which is the French utility. They are quite heavily investing into off-grid energy in in sub-Saharan Africa, and I think they've also done. I mean, I, I don't know the intricacies, but uh, they they have done a good job of kind of keeping the 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 local leadership team in place so they're not just kind of buying the companies and trying to take it over but they're actually trying to then scale some of the solutions that uh, that that we're seeing there so you know there's there's one example of how such corporations can work where you shift some of the money uh, toward toward these entrepreneurs I know this would be this is just uh, you know uh, it's 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 so crazy that I'm almost uh, afraid to to say it but uh, the best way of what you could do of course is kind of one of true solidarity right so what I talked about in terms of you know what Fatima said in terms of collaborations with academics and and you know these huge inequalities and how you can solve that is by you know being having solidarity and writing grant proposals together where you kind of write a grant proposal and submit it but you actually use the research question that your collaborators actually define and you work for them kind of even though it's your money kind of way you know where you have these kind of arrangements if we could have something on like that on the business side that would of course be great where where companies are actually you know engaging in and, and some of them doing it like the really big companies are doing it uh you know with their with their foundation work but i think you you can you can scale, scale this up where you provide some of the ex like crazy amounts of capital that we have in the global north and redistribute some of that to towards uh these uh these these uh, these african African entrepreneurs and innovators and and I strongly believe that and you know the little research that is out there that really strongly suggests that local embeddedness understanding the local context the local structures and also for you know long-term sustainability you absolutely it's absolutely critical to work with African entrepreneurs and, and you know uh, forming these partnerships and and giving leadership and agency to these African entrepreneurs absolutely critical here and uh, uh, so so yeah and then of course you can influence development policy as well but they yeah, b2b partners partnerships uh, as well. So it's quite a systemic thing. But um, I think, yeah, trust into the, the creativity, the innovativeness of, of the existing businesses and the huge, huge, huge business opportunity that kind of comes with it. We don't only have to do this for like socioeconomic reasons, just like the, the population growth numbers I just gave, uh, right? They're, they're completely crazy. And the African population is going to double in the next, what, 30, 40 years or something. Uh, and it's, it's the only continent where this is happening. So, you know, the, the the business uh, opportunities that are really great. Thank you. And then one quick last question that Matthias um, snuck in when I said it's the last question. If I'm funding um, and scaling, so can the example of linking energy and cooling be scaled up quickly to be structured as large syndicated pro uh, project and thus get a corresponding ticket size as well as a risk protection? Yeah. That, that's such a good question, Matthias. And it's one point that I didn't really make the the you know we we sometimes and I just kind of did it myself right I romanticized this idea of uh, of of local embeddedness right but embeddedness actually if you're really deeply embedded in in like Kalangala or something and you really know the farmers the fishermen the the local supply chain that scales really poorly right uh, because like you know to be embedded you you really need these social structures um so what you would have to do uh, uh so so from from I think a business perspective right like a business kind of model can 
linking energy and maybe let me uh, kind of cooling maybe uh, you know just productive uses right and in other regions you might not have like cooling that is a productive use for you but maybe other you know cooling is actually a really big thing also for other agricultural produce um but but you know it could be other it could be milling or it could be carpentry or it could be brick making or egg incubation or whatever you may have right uh, the idea of combining those two to scale mini grids i think is very attractive and it's certainly something that you can you can do well you you do have to adjust it to the local circumstances and so it might be difficult to do it with one company to kind of scale it you know in all these different places but you could think a little bit more about uh, portfolios where you design policies and finance mechanisms that specifically target you know, energy for sustainable development. It is now happening, but it's been really slow because the UN is also organized, right? We have, you know, the, the all these UN SD, uh, organizations that, that look at one SDG and they just want to solve SDG 7 and they want to solve SDG 8 and they want to solve SDG 1. And there's very seldom you have these interlinkages between departments in GIZ or in, you know, the UN or wherever uh, to actually come together to build these uh, kind of integrated finance mechanisms. So it can be, it can be structured um, probably like through some like, like bottom-up franchising type type ideas, uh, it can be scaled, um, but uh, but you need to be smart of kind of you know how you build your portfolio there. Thank you, Philip, <laughs> for this um, engaging session. Um, we are very much at the end of our time now. We are a minute over, so uh, thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your insights and your thoughts with us. Um, your uh, the the final session of the summer semester. Um, so uh, to all of the participants, just as an outlook, we'll be back in the winter semester, um, and we'll uh, we'll get started from there again. You'll find the upside, uh, updates on the website, so um, you can also see it in a chat with the ladies. And um, yeah, with that, uh, I would like to thank you, Philip, for the presentation, and thank Serena for co-hosting the session. And um, let's say goodbye for now. See you thank next you. semester and thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Philip. Thank you so much, Serena. Thanks, Samantha. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, everybody, for listening and tuning in. Thank you, Philip. I'll say goodbye now.